So I, I killed them. I, I actually, I killed them both. And I didn't want to, of course. I had high hopes this time that I would not kill them. But these are my office plants. And, you know, one thing, just something got away from me. And I, I was over here more than over at the other building. And, and before you know it, they were dead. Which is really kind of lousy because I, I sort of have a green thumb. Like, sort of. But, like, for everything that's outside, I have a green thumb, which is probably because, like, God helps me out there, right? So, but when they're fully in my control, I, I cannot keep them alive. And I've tried for years. Now, I, some of you might remember, uh, this is kind of the only part of the movie that I really remember. It kind of, kind of, like, stuck with me. It was a movie called 28 Days. It's a Sandra Bullock film. It's, like, from forever ago. And in this, it's a, it's a story about a, a whole group of people who are in recovery. And so uh, they're addicts and they're struggling uh, with their addictions. And uh, there's, this, there's this little theme that is kind of woven into the story, which is if you're in recovery, you have to stay out of a relationship because you're not well enough to actually have a relationship. The way you know that you're ready is you go out and you get a house plant. And if you can keep it alive for like a year or something, then you can go and get a pet. And if you can keep the pet alive for like a year or so, then you're allowed to start dating again. Like it's some like funny rule of thumb or something. And I don't know, you know, it, it was very clever. I remember it. I thought, oh, it's actually not bad, bad wisdom. And so I was talking to Chris and Trevor. I'm like, you know, here we are. We're, we're like trying to like lead the church and bring like all this health and vitality and expansion and reach more and more people. I can't keep a plant alive. Like, is this a good plan? I feel like, I feel like this, that's a bad sign. You know, I can't keep the plant alive. And, of course, you know, what does it take? It should, it should be easier to keep a plant alive than it really is. And so, you know, you kind of ask, have to ask, how do, you know, how do you get a green thumb? Like, what is it? What's involved? And, of course, you're not here for any sort of, like, gardening lesson, especially from me, since I kill things. Um, but, but we are here for spiritual lessons. And Jesus did this very thing. He constantly grabbed pictures from nature, and then he applied them into the spiritual realm. And he, and he, and he pressed us and he challenged us with these, uh, with these stories and these observations about the way the world really works. And then he, he drove home these deeper spiritual truths. And that's what we're going to be doing in this particular section of the Gospel of Mark. We're in this series, it's called On the Move, and it's a little bit of a different series for us because we're actually just going to take the whole book of, well, the plan was to take the whole book of Mark and just go verse by verse, cover the whole of the Bible, try to comment on most every passage and uh, see how it goes and just kind of cover what we can cover. And so uh, we had a real slow start. We uh, were having a hard time getting out of Mark 1. And, and, uh, you know, the section that we're in now is great um, and it's Mark chapter 4, and we're going to learn how Jesus, kind of like this relentlessness that he pursued in the work of the kingdom, and how he invites us into his relentless work of bringing the kingdom of God here on earth. It's a very exciting passage. The, the problem is, of course, I'm back in Mark 4, and some of you are going to remember that we shouldn't be in Mark 4, because Chris so boldly proclaimed he was covering three chapters last week. So he was going to cover chapter three, which, by the way, I had already covered most of chapter three. So I don't know what he was talking about. And then he did cover five, which was great, but he cut co- four? Really? We have Mark chapter four. Mark chapter four is incredible. Jesus steps into that boat, and he tells amazing, amazing parables. You should definitely read it. All right, Mark chapter five. <laughs> Can you tell I'm trying to brag that I covered three chapters in one day? That's the best Mark four sermon ever. That's not, you can't count that, Chris. Come on. You can't, you got to give me four at least. I, I can't, I'm not going to. So we're back at, at Mark chapter four. We're starting in verse one and we are looking at the parables and the parables are, you know, think of a parable as kind of like a, a, a picture. A, 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 it's a, it's a story and it usually has one main point. You don't have to draw like connections between every single part of a parable and the spiritual world. Uh, kind of make sure you get like the big point, but don't also, you know, don't be afraid that it, there, there are other kind of sub stories, you know, and, and sometimes there are more applications than at first appear on the surface of it. And so we can go a little further than some of the interpreters of late have been doing, but 
but not so far that we have to like press it into make, some, make something of every part of a parable. They're kind of like general big ideas and we get to uh, kind of learn something spiritual about it and something important. But one of the neat things about parables is that the whole genre is meant to both reveal and conceal at the same time. And we'll see that idea that, that it's concealing for some, but it's revealing for others. And we'll see that over and over as we work through a whole bunch of these uh, parables here this morning. So chapter 4, verse 1. Again, Jesus began to teach by the lake. The crowd that gathered around him was so large that he got into a boat and sat in it out on the lake. While all the people were along the shore at the water's edge, he taught them many things by parables. And in his teaching said, listen, a farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path. The birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plants so that they did not bear grain. Still other seed fell on good soil. It came up, grew and produced a crop, some multiplying 30, some 60, some 100 times. So we get kind of the picture here. The farmer is the same farmer. He's doing the same work. The seed is the same seed. There's nothing variable about that. The sun is the same sun. The water is the same water. The rain that comes is the same rain. It, it, all of those elements are all the same. But the variable here is the soil. Now, fortunately, in this parable, he's about to explain the parable to us, which is really, really great. But before he does that, there's this little interlude. And it's, it's important for some kind of framing the context as to what's going on. So take a look at verse 9. Then Jesus said, whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. When he was alone, the twelve and the others around him asked him about the parables. He told them, the secret of the kingdom of God has been given to you, but to, to, but to those on the outside, everything is said in parables, so that they may be ever seeing but never perceiving and ever hearing but never understanding. Otherwise, they might turn and be forgiven. So he uses this phrase in verse 9, ears to hear. And it sounds kind of like a little, uh, like a saying of speech, you know, some sort of turn of phrase or something like that. It's actually a reference to a couple of Old Testament texts. And so just like if you could imagine putting yourself back in the day, the Jews knew the Old Testament cold. Jesus certainly knew the Old Testament cold. When he uses that phrase, the idea behind it is that you would, your mind would go back to the the texts where it shows up in the Old Testament. If I sang you some lyrics, which I should just do for fun, but if I sang you lyrics of a famous song, you would go back and you'd remember the whole song. And so that's kind of the idea that he references this phrase, ears to hear, and it will bring you back into the Old Testament. And it's important to get the context a little bit because like, for instance, in Jeremiah, hear this, you foolish and senseless people who have eyes but do not see and have ears but do not hear. Or Ezekiel, son of man, you are living among a rebellious people. They have eyes to see but do not see and ears to hear but do not hear for they are a rebellious people. So why is he bringing them back to these texts? So when you read the context, what you find out is that this was a period, this was a period in Israel's history when they were stiff-necked and refused to listen. They refused to listen to the prophets. They refused to obey God. And because of it, God kept warning them that judgment was coming. The nations around them were gathering up their strength, and God was going to drag their enemies through their land, and they were going to be judged. So when he references this, he says, listen, I just told you a story about a farmer and some soils, but don't think for a second that this is child's play or that I'm talking about fairy tales or cute little parables that you might be able to go home and tell your kids at bedtime. He's raising the stakes by referencing these Old Testament prophecies. Now, that's part of it, but there's also another very beautiful part. In both of these texts, Jeremiah and Ezekiel, there's not just the group of people who are rebellious. In both contexts, there is a promise that there will be a remnant, that there will be a group of people 
who will in fact hear and will obey. That they will let their hearts be softened, that they will be transformed, that they will actually do. So it's a warning to most people, but it's also a promise that there is still hope for those who want it. So I think he's framing this whole conversation by using that phrase, ears to hear. Now in verse 11, he told them the secret of the kingdom of God. And when he, he talks about a secret here, it's not a, you know, like some sort of secret society handshake thing that if you knew it, you'd get in. It's not, he doesn't, he doesn't have that kind of a, a category or a background. He's talking about something that was concealed or hard to see in the past, but is now being revealed. And what is it he's talking about? The kingdom of God. The coming of the kingdom of God, which even in our own Lord's prayer, we pray all the time. His kingdom come. His will be done. That's what we're praying for, is that God's kingdom would come here on earth. And when the Jews thought about God's kingdom coming on earth, they had one picture of it. That a conquering Messiah would run through the land and kick all the Romans out. That was the picture. And he's saying, but that's not actually how the kingdom of God is going to come. In fact, all, all these parables point to a very different picture. He's saying, no, the, the kingdom of God has already come in him. He is the beginning. He is the beachhead. He is breaking in. The kingdom of God is now touching earth in the life of Christ. And in every single person who is productive in the kingdom, the kingdom of God is starting to take ground that we're battling against the forces of evil and we're taking back the planet, but not in the way that they, the Jewish people had originally thought, but in a way that is far more subtle and a far slower start, but with an impact that would be felt around the world. That's the secret of the kingdom of God. He also says here, we just comment on it briefly in verse 12, where it says, otherwise they might turn and be forgiven. And the reason I just comment on it is because some people have used this to say, look, Jesus was intentionally trying to confuse people so that they wouldn't actually be able to seek forgiveness. And of course, you can't, you know, it's a, it's a big jump to go that way because everything else we know about Jesus shows that he was granting forgiveness to Anyone who would want it. I mean, the, even, he offered forgiveness even to the people who were nailing him to the cross. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. How many times did he tell us to forgive someone? 70 times 7. It's, there's no limit to the amount of times. So he clearly can't be saying, I'm refusing to forgive them. Remember, he's quoting a passage here, and he's already framed it with the Jeremiah and the Ezekiel passage. So what is he talking about? He's saying, listen, you, the, the truth of the matter is, no matter what we say, some people are going to refuse the gift of forgiveness. You know, some say he's using hyperbole. Some say it's kind of an ironic twist. It's hard to really kind of know the linguistical structure of what he's doing. But he's clearly making a point to say, you know what? You know, they could easily be forgiven. But they're going to refuse. Just like so many before them. Now he jumps in, and he, I love this part because he actually tells us the whole meaning of the parable, which is great. Verse 13, then Jesus said to them, don't you understand this parable? How then will you understand any parable? A little bit of a barb there. The farmer sows the word. Some people are like seed along the path where the word is sown. As soon as they hear it, Satan comes and takes away the word that was sown in them. Others, like seed sown on rocky places, hear the word and at once receive it with joy. But since they have no root... They last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. Still others, like seed sown among thorns, hear the word, but the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth, the desires for other things come in and choke the word, making it unfruitful. Others, like seed sown on good soil, hear the word, accept it, and produce a crop, some 30, some 60, some 100 times what was sown. So the seed, of course, is the, is the key idea that he starts with as being reliable. There's nothing about the seed you need to worry about. Seed is the word of God. It's brought to us by God through Christ and in us. The seed you don't need to worry about. Some years ago, there was a company that was trying to pick up these like uh, biblical themes to sell their wares. And so they had sent out a little advertising piece and they had taped a seed to it and they said, hey, 
if you had faith the size of this mustard seed in our product, then you will get all of whatever you need from this product. Right? Just totally like a brazen try to you know, co-op the scriptures for their own you know, selfish gain. And so uh, some months later, they got a letter back and said, Dear sirs, thank you so much for the seed um, that you sent me. This mustard seed uh, was a received gift. Uh, and I took it and planted it. And it produced a bushel of tomatoes. Which, of course, means they didn't even send them a mustard seed. Um, so, you know, this is, we look at that, we're like, you got to trust the seed. You, the seed doesn't matter here. Jesus makes no point about the seed other than that the farmer is throwing it everywhere he can. Some have criticized the farmer for throwing it wide and far and on places that clearly wouldn't grow. Just points to the heart of God saying, the seed is going to go out and it's going to be received or rejected. But it's going out. But the key here is, of course, the soil. He starts with the seed along the path, and he says this points to the hardness of heart, which we've seen so much. Now, you know, I doubt people who are, you know, all right, so there's two ways to think about these soils. One is in terms of salvation from heaven or hell, justification, we call that in, in like kind of theological circles, meaning three of the four seeds clearly don't know Jesus, one of them does. And that's certainly a key way to understand this parable. But there's another way of understanding it for all people who are in fact followers of Christ. Jesus doesn't always use our theological categories. And so another way of thinking about these soils is for every follower of Christ to say, what do I see in my own heart? Do I see threads of this hardness coming in? Because if, if you really are a person who just rejects it, then you're not here today. You know, unless somebody bribed you or dragged you quite literally here, you're not even listening to this because you're, you're, the hardness of your heart says, I don't, I don't need any of this. But I think all of us have also experienced a little bit of the hardness of heart where we've stopped really caring for Christ or for others. And we've said, you know what? These things don't really matter or impact me anymore. There's another type of hardship he talks about you know how the, the rocky soil is such that, that once the, the plant springs up, before it has time to fruit, that it actually is just going to wither in the heat. This we see a lot more. People come to Christ and they're like, yeah, this is great. I'm so excited to be a Christian. It's going gonna, it's gonna to fix all of my problems. And often for a little while it does because you're excited about this new thing and because God sort of puts this hedge of protection around you when, when you're a child in the faith, and as he begins to withdraw that, to give us the space we need to actually grow in faith, to give us the challenges we actually need to really genuinely suffer, all of a sudden people start talking about how they don't trust God anymore, how he's not trustworthy because they're suffering, they're hurting. It's like, well, but wait, you trusted him when all things were going well because what you really wanted was you wanted your sugar daddy able to give you exactly what you want for your life when you want it. You're not loving God for who he is and for what he wants to do in your life. You're saying the health, the wealth, the prosperity, that's what I want. As long, you, how many times do we say it ourselves? As long as I got my health. What do you mean by that? As long as you have, so when you don't have your health, you'll reject him? What do we mean by that? He's not promising you those things. What if that's the very thing that he needs to pull back from you in order to do the spiritual work in your heart that is essential? The hardship is key. Third type of soil, the thorny soil. It hampers. You guys see what I'm doing here, right? I mean, hardens, hardship, hampers. Tell me that's not impressive. That's like serious alliteration going on there. That's like, that's like top grade preacher stuff. I worked all week just to give you guys that. You don't even seem remote. That's a, thank you for that. He's clapping. Thank you, Danny. Thank you for that. I thank you. See? That is, this is like graduate level preacher stuff right there. I grew up, it was always alliterated. And so that's, you know, so it hampers. And so these things choke. And I think we see this a lot. A lot of folks never even consider coming to faith because their lives are so busy and so preoccupied in so many ways. And for me personally, this is what I see happen most. There's just so many things pulling for my attention. So many other interests, so many other things, ways I have to like get, get going and, and commitments that I've made that I have to fulfill and, you know, family responsibilities, work responsibilities. You've got all of these things that happen. All of a sudden, you wake up one day and you're like, when's the last time I actually spent some real time with Jesus? 
When's the last time that I actually was doing something for the kingdom that I know God was, was calling me into? You know, we get so pulled and choked out by the distractions of this world. And of course, the last one is the good soil, and that is the nailed it. The harvest. Come on, that is awesome, man. So you get you get you get the harvest, and of course, he talks about it 30, 60, 90, 90 100 fold, which is just a, a great productive crop. And this idea that what happens now is an invitation to you. Right? That's what he's doing. He's inviting you. He's saying, listen, where are you at? What's going on in your own? So in the ancient, we control everything, right? We 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 have geo tracking for our, our farm tools and we use irrigation you know expertise we control everything in the produce of you know our wheat and, and grains and all that in the ancient world that wasn't the case in the ancient world you took good seed and you planted it in the soil and if the rain came it came and if it didn't you had drought and everything died if the sun shined then your plants would grow if it shined in the wrong season everything would die see you didn't have control over those things in the ancient world what you had control over was the soil. You could till the soil. You could amend the soil. This is a challenge and an invitation for us to examine our hearts and to get rid of all of these things, to till up the hardness that we find in there and to rip out the thorns, to pull them out and to get, to, to get them, out, to, you know, to throw them into the furnace, as it says in another place. He's saying, what are you going to do to amend the soil of your heart so that when the seed comes in, it produces this bounty? Because the bounty is expected. The harvest is the expectation that Jesus and the prophets have put on us when it comes to serving God. He talks about the next parable in verse 21. He switches gears here. He says, he said to them, do you bring in a lamp and put it under a bowl or a bed? Instead, don't you put it on its stand? For whatever is hidden is meant to be disclosed and whatever is concealed is meant to be brought out into the open. So these little lamps are little oil lamps. You kind of pinched a corner there. You put oil in it. You put a wick in it. You light it. And they offer up a little bit of light in the room. And I think sometimes, you know, we feel this way. We're like, that's what I feel like, a little bit of light. But a little bit of light can save a life. Before electric light, you take that little bit of light, and that's what you might very well need to continue doing the work that sunset would have brought to an end. And he says here, listen, if you, you, you're talking about being good soil. You want to know a quick test to find out if you have good soil? Is your light shining? That's one of the key ways of understanding productivity. What does it mean to produce a harvest? I think he's giving us a hint here with the next parable. I think he's saying, you want to know what it means? It means let your light shine. Sometimes people will tell me, a Christian will tell me, absolutely, I'm a Christian. I do this. I kind of bring it all in. I've been studying. I've been getting all these inputs. And that's great. That is fantastic stuff. I love that. We should all be kind of pursuing that. But, but he's saying let your light shine. What does that mean? He's talking about letting it shine for people who are in darkness. And you might say, yeah, but I feel like such a little light. But that doesn't matter because in actuality, the smallest light will drive back the darkest darkness. Have you ever seen that? It doesn't matter how dark it is. Pitch black. Can't see a thing. Turn on your, your, your phone light and all of a sudden you're like, whoa, I can see stuff. The smallest of lights can push back the darkest of darkness. And that's his point, is that, that you might feel and even be the smallest of lights, but you are meant to shine. Do you? Do others see it? That's part of what it means to be productive in the kingdom. Because whatever is concealed, he says, is meant to be brought out into the open. Take your light, join it with other lights. And see what great things can happen. He says here in verse 23, if anyone has ears to hear, let them hear. Repeating that warning to us. Verse 24, consider carefully what you hear. He continued, with the measure you use, it will be measured to you and even more. Whoever has will be given more. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. An important spiritual principle as we see in most of these 
And pretty much I think what he's trying to summarize here for us is if you want this, you will get it. If you desire to grow in Christ, you will grow. And if you want to go deeper, you will go deeper. The measure you use will be measured back to you. But if, if you don't, even what you have will be taken. And this is a little bit more of an ominous note because he's saying, you know, you feel like I've got this thing going on in my Christian life, but you're not moving forward. Most certainly you're moving backward. There's no steady state in the Christian life. I've seen this too often where people are like, you know what, I'm good right here. They never stay right there. You push forward, you fall back. Even what you have will be taken from you if you are not pressing forward. But the beauty is you can press forward and you can go deeper. And if you want it, you will get it. If you're saying, oh man, I don't get it, I'm not growing, nothing's happening, it's got... It's not because God doesn't want it to be so. There's issues in the soil that need to be tended. The next parable is called the parable of the growing seed. Verse 26, he also said, this is what the kingdom of God is like. A man scatters seed on the ground night and day, whether he sleeps or gets up, the seed sprouts and grows, though he does not know how. All by itself, the soil produces grain. First the stalk, then the head, then the full kernel in the head. As soon as the grain is ripe, he puts the sickle to it because the harvest has come. I love that phrase he uses in here, all by itself, because, of course, that's how it, we experience it. You put a seed in the ground, and you don't see all the other work. You don't see the bacteria working on the husk of the seed. You don't see the water getting wet. You don't see the beginning of the roots or anything like that. All of that is sort of the, the mystery behind the, the, the growth cycle. All we know is we put the seed in, and eventually we get the, the produce if the soil is good which is fantastic, but there's this all by itself piece, which of course isn't all by itself. That's the God piece. That's the part that, that God built into the system. That's how he wired the plants to work. That's the DNA he infused. That's the water and the light and the, and the, the stuff that's there around it that is growing, the nutrients that are hiding in the soil that you can't even see. And so there's this partnership that happens. We do our part, God does his part, his part is bigger and more important, and our part is essential. That's how he designed it. We do our part, God does his part. We're not responsible for the harvest. He is, but we're responsible to do our part. And I love this idea because it frees us in so many ways. You know, sometimes you can look at a church like Beacon and us. We, we have these ideas and we have these dreams about what God is going to do and how he's going to impact Long Island. And, and, and you know, let's, let's see about starting campuses and locations and reach more people and, and impact more lives and help more people who are in need. And we have all of these grand dreams. And sometimes people will be like, man, you, you're kind of getting a little bit like ahead of yourselves. And we can because it's not us doing it. We do our part. God does his part. See, we work like everything depends on us. We pray like everything depends on him and then dream God-sized dreams and let him bring the growth. Let him develop the spiritual power in each and every one of us. He also has this reference to a sickle, which once again, these are, these are these kinds of references we don't want to miss because in Joel chapter 3, it says, Swing the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Come, trample the grapes, for the wine press is full and the vats overflow. So great is their wickedness. Once again, Jesus cannot escape. He cannot resist offering the warning because he wants us to see that this is high stakes mission. What we're doing matters. Judgment is inevitable. It will come. That's a promise of the prophets. It's a promise of Christ himself. Do the work while there is still day to do it. Because one day, he wraps this thing up. When that day comes, the sickle collects the harvest. And there's no more sowing and there's no more growing and there's no more wheat to produce. It brings an end to this phase of human history. 
The last parable I want to cover starts in verse 30. Again, he said, What shall we say the kingdom of God is like? Or what parable shall we use to describe it? It's like a mustard seed, which is the smallest of all seeds on earth. Yet when planted, it grows and becomes the largest of all garden plants with such big branches that the birds can perch in its shade. With many similar parables, Jesus spoke the word to them as much as they could understand. He did not say anything to them without using a parable. But when he was alone with his his own disciples, he explained everything. So we have this idea, the mustard seed, super tiny. He calls it the smallest of seeds. Critics will tell you it's not the smallest of seeds. Actually, the orchid is. Therefore, Jesus can't be trusted. Okay. Which, of course, sort of is ironic because it really kind of proves his point. If you're looking for a reason not to follow Jesus, you will certainly find a reason not to follow Jesus. You know, more than likely what he's doing is he's talking about classes of seeds, meaning the seeds maybe he was sitting with right there as he was teaching and had them in his hand. It could be that he was talking about a class of seeds, these particular types of garden seeds that you plant that produce things, not like orchids, which are pretty, but not actually useful for food. It could be that he was simply using the proverb of the mustard seed and the tree, which every Jewish person would have known because it was a common contrast between little seed and big tree. The part that is actually more interesting to me, you know, not whether or not, you know, Jesus can be trusted because the orchid seed is smaller, uh, is because there's another piece of the mustard seed picture that I just came across this week. And I, I, hope, it, I hope it's legit and I want to do some more research on it, but I, I didn't. So here we go. Uh, what, I, what, I, what it said was that there is a particular trait. So the mustard seed only grows to like a shrub of like 10 feet which isn't like a mighty thing. Like in the Old Testament, they would talk about this kingdom of God. They'd talk about like cedars and, you know, tall trees and oaks and like something big and substantial. And this isn't that. This is a garden shrub. So like what's he talking about? And someone uh, was making the observation that it has a particular... Anybody recognize what this is? This is Joe Pieweed. So I love Joe Pieweed because it's big, it's purple, and it grows in the summer, which a lot of plants don't do. It blooms in the summer. So I planted it but it it has the name weed in it because that's what it is. When I decided I didn't want it anymore, (laughs) nope, I pulled it out from where it was because I didn't want it and it popped up over here and there and there in places I never planted it all over my yard and the neighbor's yard. All of a sudden this thing keeps coming up. It's like playing whack-a-mole in my garden. I just keep yanking, it doesn't matter. And one of the commentators described the mustard tree that grew at this time in this region as a a plant like this. Talked about it as if it were a weed, which I love, because if this is true, what, what Jesus is sort of indicating here is that, you know what, once this thing takes root, it doesn't matter what happens next. Cut it down, burn it to the ground, pull it as you will. Bleed it out. It does not matter because you will not stop it. The kingdom of God starts small, but it is relentless. It will impact every people, every tongue, every tribe, and it will do it through you. It's going to do it through your life. I love to see this picture because it means that there is no promise of God that is ever going to go ultimately unanswered. He is going to reach the planet as he promised and he is going to use his people to do it if you will be productive for the kingdom. So what does that mean? It means that we must, we must let our soil be good. And if you want to be productive, it means that you will have a life that will grow in the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, gentleness, goodness, kindness, self-control. It means you will wrestle with holiness when the Spirit presses upon you and convicts you of sin, that you'll wrestle with it and you'll give those things up. You want to know what productivity means? It means that when, when you feel hardness of heart and a lack of generosity toward those in need, that you give anyway because it softens your heart and it becomes the kind of heart that is good soil. But in this context, most importantly, what it means is that you let your light shine. You want to reproduce in the kingdom because that is what we are called to do. Good soil reproduces. Let your light shine. 
Let the world see. Tell the story of Christ wherever you go. And let faith like a mustard seed relentlessly take this planet back for the kingdom. I'm going to ask the band to come up. I'm going to offer a prayer that God would do the work that only God could do. Lord, what I'm asking here for each and every one of us is that you would so fill us with your spirit that you would convict us, Lord, when there's hardness and when we're distracted, when we've decided to pursue our own ends rather than yours, when we've forgotten that our time here is short and the work is great. We pray for your forgiveness of these things. And Lord, we pray that you would, in fact, give each person here a longing, a desire to be the kind of soil that reproduces abundantly for the kingdom. No matter what comes, we know we can trust in you and your power. Let your light shine through each and every one of us. We pray it in Christ's name. Amen. Would you stand?